Do you have that kind of passion for Jesus? What is the cost that you are willing to pay to be on the winning team? Perhaps you'll make a public stand. You know, every time one of your students in high school, in a public high school, stands up for Jesus, they're paying a price. They may be losing friends. They may be standing alone. They're paying a price. Are you willing to do that? Are you willing to give up your time, your talents, and your treasure? Jesus says, you know, what you love the best, that's where your, tre where your treasure is. Are you willing to take, open your wallet? Are you willing to take the time to go down and, and teach children? Are you willing to walk over to your neighbor's house and say, hey, why don't you come to church with me today? What are you willing to pay? Are you willing to leave your comfort zone? Are you willing to step out of that area where you're the most comfortable? Where you, um, in your pew, where you know what your limitations are? Are you willing to step out of that comfort zone? Are you willing to start a Bible study? Are you willing to stand up in front of the church <laughs> and talk? What are you willing to do? What price are you willing to pay? Are you willing to leave your home and your family? Some people are. They're willing to step out so far out of their comfort zone that they will leave everything behind because they want to be on the winning team. They have that kind of passion for Jesus. Are you willing to give your life? You know, this last year, I have a friend who died within days of coming back from Tanzania. And she died in joy because that's where she wanted to be. Last week, or two weeks ago, I had a friend die um, of appendicitis, of all things. But she was in, in uh, Nairobi, and she was ministering to a pastor in Nairobi. And she died where she wanted to be. That's what she wanted to be doing when she died. Are you willing to step out so far that you're willing to die for your father? God. I have two friends that have been kidnapped in, in the Middle East. They were kidnapped in, in um, I think it was July last year. They were taken, they were beaten, they were uh, starved. They were eventually returned to their homes and you know what they're doing now? They have an underground church in a place where you're not allowed, you're not allowed to mention the name of Jesus. And they're still doing it. They're willing to give their lives for the passion that they have. Jesus wants us to build our life on a firm foundation. That's number three. He wants us to know who he is. He wants us to know what's in his book. He wants to know those laws and the things that, that, that are in his heart. He wants us to know who He is so that He can be a part of us. And when, as we know who He is, and as we get stronger in that, as we become more and more familiar with who Jesus is, and build that firm foundation, then we can depend more and more on Him because we know He's going to be there when we need Him. There is a, a town um, not very far from my, my village of Mia. It's called Luanda. And the one means the rock. And it is literally this little town that is set upon these huge rocks. And the river Yala floods every year. Every year, this, this huge river will flood. Do you know the river Yala? It floods this town. But the town will not go away because it is built on rock. It is not built on sand. That's what God wants us to be. He wants us to be built on sand, on rock. Matthew 7.24 says, Therefore, anyone who hears these words of mine and puts them 
into practice. Right there. Puts them into practice. <laughs> that's, the, that's the key words. Those are the key ones. It's like a wise man who builds his house on a rock. The rain came down, the streams rose, the winds blew and beat against that house, yet it did not fall because it had its foundation on the rock. And our rock is Jesus Christ. He also says to seek Him. Seek Him first, and then He's going to give you all of these things. All of the needs that you have, He is going to give you. Because you are going to Him. You are coming to know who He is. You are building your foundation in Him. And no one knows this better than missionaries who are cross-cultural missionaries. I can tell you so many times that when we saw him, he showed up. And it was always a surprise. Um, this last year that we went to Chichukana, it had been raining in the mountains. And of course, when it rains in the mountains, it falls down in the middle of this bowl. And there are no roads there. So you have to drive through these rivers of water. And one of the rivers of water came all the way up, we, we take public transportation, came all the way up to the side, to the boot of the, of the bus. And we had taken with us lots of medicine, uh, some maize, because people had been starving, and, and other items, you know, our clothes and things like that. The clothes got wet. The medicine and the maize remained dry. I don't know how that happened, <laughs> but I can just, I, I, I envision a picture of this angel, you know, just holding that. And, and then, we were in, um, in Turkana, and it hadn't rained for such a long time. And the women were there, and they were saying, can you pray for us, can you pray for rain, can you please pray for rain? And um, Elizabeth, you know, most of you know Elizabeth, said, we can all pray for rain. You can pray for rain. Let's pray for rain. And they started praying for rain. And before the amen, it started raining. I, I'm not joking. It started, you can see the pictures downstairs. I have the pictures downstairs. And it wasn't just a sprinkle or two. It was a good solid 20 minutes of rain. And I have gone there for seven years, and I have never had a drop of rain fall on me. But that day it did. And the amazing thing is it didn't rain in Lodoire, which was 10 kilometers away. It didn't rain in Mapuchogia. It rained right where we were. You've probably heard that story from Elizabeth. <laughs> it was amazing. God does this all the time. And we're always surprised and we're always delighted when it happens. God also requires that we have an immediate commitment and a complete surrender. It isn't, okay, God, I'd really like to follow you, but I'll tell you what, um, give me a couple years. That doesn't work. Jesus replied. He was talking, he was hanging out with his friends, and he was talking to them, and somebody said, I'm going to follow you. I want, I want to come with you, Jesus. And he said, foxes have dens and birds have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. Now, I don't know about you, but if somebody is saying to me, you know, Yvonne, I, I want to come on mission with you. I'm not going to say, you know, you're not going to have any place to lay your head. That's not my first thing to say. But a very wise woman, Elizabeth, does that. When somebody wants to be a part of our mission, she sits them down and she shows them pictures and she says, you know, you lay outside on a mat. You don't have a house to live in. You eat what, what, what the Turkanans eat. You sit with your feet out because there are no chairs. That's what a wise woman said, and that's what Jesus said. He said, count the cost. There's going to be a cost here. You're not going to have a place to stay. Remember that. If you, do you still want to follow me? He said to another man, he invited him, follow me. But the man replied, Lord, let me first go bury my father. Jesus said to him, 
Let the dead bury their own dead. But you go and proclaim the kingdom of God. He said, no. Now is the time. You want to follow me? I need an immediate commitment. I'm not going to let you just go off and do something else because you're going to change your mind. You're going to be distracted. I need you to follow me now. Still another man said, I'll follow you, Lord, but first let me go back and say goodbye to my family. That seems like a very reasonable request. But Jesus said, no one who puts a hand to a plow and looks back is fit for service in the kingdom of God. Those are very strong words. Jesus expects when you make a commitment, it is a full commitment, it is an immediate commitment, and it is complete surrender. Is, is the criteria for discipleship. Unwavering, devoted loyalty, God is the first one, the only one that matters. Count the cost, count the cost, be ready to pay. Build a strong foundation in his word. And Jesus requires complete and immediate surrender if you want to be a disciple of his. But there are benefits. There are benefits. You know, Jesus doesn't need us to be his, his disciples because he needs us to work for him. He wants us to be his disciples so that we can live a full life, an abundant life, so that, so that we have a reason for leaving the pews. Jesus wants us to be a part of his program because he has a better way. I live an extraordinary life. I, I travel all over the world and, I, and, and, and all I do is talk about who God is. It's amazing. I am stretched every which way to north, south, east, and west. And, and I love it. If you make your commitment and you become a disciple, he is going to stretch you. And you're going to love it because he's going to give you the desires of your heart, which are the desires of his heart. Because his desire is for you to be the best person that you can be. The person that he created you to be. His beloved disciple. He's calling you. He's calling you to this, to the Great Commission. These are the final words that Jesus said to his disciples. These are the final words that Jesus said audibly to us. Then Jesus came to them all and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. I'm telling you, be a disciple. Make the commitment today. Amen? Amen. Amen. Um, we have